Okay, excellent. Let's get started. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name is Mario Sanchez, and I run training here at Sumo Logic. And today I'm going to be talking about how to use Sumo Logic. So a lot of what we're going to be doing today is is a lot of how tos. How do I query my data? How do I parse my data? Um, from what I saw from the poll that I put out earlier, um, I see that most of you are brand new to Sumo Logic. So I'm going to start with a 30,000 foot view and start diving into the specifics. Having said that, I do want to point out that there, um, this is one of three sessions. Uh, most of you probably went here into the Sumo Logic training page and you, um, and you registered for this, uh, for this webinar, which we're calling using Sumo Logic. Um, I do want to point out that this is the uh, this is one of three sessions. The first one is Sumo uh, Sumo Logic Quick Start. So I'm going to try to not cover as much um, repeat material. I'm assuming most of you already attended the Quick uh, Quick Start Sumo Logic, which is showing you a little more of the capabilities. What we're going to be focusing on today on this third webinar is how to use it, how to use some of the advanced analytics, how to dig a little bit deeper. And for those who are you administrators. I would highly suggest that you attend this session called Setting Up Sumo Logic, which walks uh, you into what walks you around uh, topics around data collection, deployment options, and optimization tools for your environment. So, having said that, um, we're today focusing on using Sumo Logic, and with that in mind, uh, let me talk a little bit about what we're going to be covering today. So. Um, the, the idea today, as I mentioned, is a little bit of how to show you how to do a lot of this content, uh, how to do a lot of this um, functionality in Sumo Logic. So after these sessions, um, as you know, these, these sessions are broken into two days. The first day, we're going to cover the topics above this line. The second day, we're going to cover the topics down here at the bottom. So today, specifically today, we're going to focus on searching and filtering your data. We're going to talk about metadata tags. We're going to talk about searching with keywords. Um, very importantly, we're going to focus quite a bit of time on parsing, how to get, how to provide structure to, the, to your data. Remember, you can send any kind of data into Sumo Logic. You can send metrics, you can send logs. Those logs could be structured or unstructured. The idea is, how do I parse fields so I can provide structure to my data so that then I can start doing some sort of aggregation and analyzing that data? Um, and today we're going to finish with analyzing the data. We're going to talk about simple aggregation, so your counts, your averages, your sums. Um, but we're also going to look into some advanced analytics, things that you can take advantage of um, right, off, right out of the gate because we've developed the tools for that. Now, having said that, these are just the stepping stones for what really, really is the benefit of a tool like Sumo Logic. So what you can do is you can start building dashboards to visualize your trends. Perhaps you want to find out trends over time. You want to start finding outliers. That's what dashboards allow you to do. Get a, get a feel for those um, uh, for those trends that are happening and get a visual of those. Um, we're also going to talk about scheduling alerts. So most of us do not get paid to look at dashboards. We actually have a, lo uh, uh, a lot of other stuff that we have to be keeping an eye on. So scheduling alerts to um, that notify you of critical events is going to become very, very important. And then the last thing that we're going to cover tomorrow is I'm going to point you to some apps. And apps in Sumo Logic are out-of-the-box content, essentially dashboards, scheduled alerts, searches, that you can take advantage of for the um, for the most common data sources. We've we've seen quite a lot of customers. We know what they need from an Apache um, Apache web server. We know what they need from a, from Box. We know what they need from their GitHub. So we can take those logs and give you already content that exists. All right. So I want to make a, a very key point here. Um, today we're going to talk about the building blocks. But at the end of the day, what you really want to get to is to build these dashboards, to build these alerts. So with that in mind, what I thought I'd do is I'd start with, I want to start with a demo of how, uh, of this final product. I'm going to show you, if you will, the, the cooked recipe. I'm going to show you how uh, a user or a customer can use these dashboards, can use these alerts in their environment to solve their issues. Um, and then we're going to backtrack and start from how do I start searching, how do I start parsing, and how to start analyzing. So. With that in mind, let me actually, before that, let me do just, just a quick intro here into that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how a, um, a customer um, uses both logs and metrics to troubleshoot their environment. Essentially, you're going to get an alert that is notifying them of some critical event in their environment. In this case, I'm using Webhook to, to send an, a message through Slack. But um, I receive this alert, and then I can take action on it. That alert 
drives me into a dashboard that is showing me some metrics that are helping me identify what the what is going on. So now with this dashboard of metrics, I can see, oh, okay, uh, it looks like my business is not doing well because I'm in this particular case, uh, what's going on is people cannot pay, they can't book their flights. And then I'm going to dive into the relevant logs. So for most of us, um, right now what we're doing is we go to one system to identify metrics and see what's going on and then we go to a different system to identify the logs to identify why this is happening i'm going to show you how sumo logic brings brings this unified logs and metrics view so that i can be looking at my metrics and dive to the relevant logs to start identifying uh, the the why why are things happening so with that said um let me just show you um first let me show you the um the sample customer that we're using. So here's a, um, a, a, a website called Travelogic, and Travelogic behind the scenes is a microservices environment, very similar to probably what you guys have. So they've got their Kubernetes, they've got their web servers, they've got all this stuff that they need to keep an eye on. Um, and this, as you can imagine, this allows me to book flight, this allows me to book hotel, this allows me to uh, book car hire. But there is some sort of an IT team or a DevOps team, IT infrastructure team behind the scenes here, keeping an eye on what's going on in this particular environment. Um, if anything happens to be uh, going on in here, they will, um, they hopefully will see a dashboard with that kind of information or they will get some sort of not notification. And um, you just saw a little Slack um, message there on my top right hand side of my screen. It's because my Slack is up and running. Um, and here's an example of the kind of messages that my app would be sending me. So in this particular case, it's saying that around 10 a.m. today, the Travelogic op Ops sent me a Slack, an alert via Slack, and um, it looks like I'm having a an outlier, a response spike. So there's something I, it's it's triggering and it's sending me this uh, this alert. Uh, here I can see the results themselves of what happened. That's, there's some query in the background using Sumo Logic that is that is going on, but it also sends me to a, a link to a dashboard so I can give, go see a little bit more information. Let me show you. Uh, what that dashboard looks like. So here it is. Um, now I'm uh, switching hats. I am the IT ops team for that Travelogic site. Here is my operational overview dashboard, right? Travelog Travelogic operational overview dashboard. And you notice um, it even has here a little mention in, ca in case someone else is looking at this um, dashboard. It's saying that our alerts are automatically delivered to this particular channel. So either I receive the alert and I know I'm notified about what's going on in here, or I have this dashboard displayed in my operations center, and I'm starting to see a lot of reds, and some some stuff uh, is is not going the way that I want. All right, let's take a step back and take a peek at what this dashboard is. Um, this is an uh, an ops overview, so I can see things like my reporting nodes. If you look at this one here, is my ELB 500s. Um, these are ELB responses. I can I can I can keep an eye on my VPC network. Um, I can see product service over here. I can see that I have no database issues. I seem to have a lot of issues with my checkout service. Um, there, is, I don't see any issues with my Redis. So in, in short, this is a dashboard that I've put together to give me a good view of everything that has happened, all the different components, all the different microservices, if you will, as well, in my, um, in my environment so that I can keep an eye on if everything's green, then I don't have to worry about it. But if I start seeing some yellows or some reds, then I probably need to take action on some stuff. So I come into my uh, dashboard, I see that my checkout service is having some issues. What I want to do is perhaps find out a little more information about that checkout service. So I'm gonna click on this particular panel in here. And when I click on that panel, it takes me to another dashboard that is showing me a little bit more information about what's going on, uh, what's going on with that services detail, uh, with, that, with those services. So right off the bat on the top left hand side where I have my bookings, let me just expand this to show you a little bit better. I can see that um, I was having all successes in terms of the bookings that people were able to uh, book flight or book travel or book hotels in my si on my site. But then somewhere around 9.50 a.m., so about, uh, let's say, 20 minutes ago, I started having some issues in here. So um, hopefully, I would have gotten an alert around that time as well. 
Um, but you notice that these dashboards are clearly, this panel is clearly showing me that kind of information. I see that starting around that same time, I started having a high number of fails. So I, ha I didn't have any fails before, and then all of a sudden I'm having a big spike in, um, in fails of bookings. So I am, through metrics, starting to identify the what. What is going on? What's, what's happening in my environment? Clearly, I know now that people cannot complete their booking. Something seems to be wrong. Um, I still don't know what it is. I, I don't know why, but I have a good idea about this. Um, just for the benefit of completeness, let me walk you through some of these other dashboards in here so you have a good idea. This one is showing me errors um, that, that might have happened um, for the last seven days. So this is showing me errors in the last day. I seem to have none. Errors in the last two days is also a flat line. Errors in the last three days seems to be a flat line. But now errors today seem to have spiked starting at 945. So this is a, this is a good view showing me that it's not something that is recurring. It's not something that around 9 a.m. or, or 9.30 or 9.45 a.m. every day I have these kinds of things. Clearly, there is an anomaly. Some errors are happening today that weren't happening before. Um, I also see a spike, um, yeah, some sort of gateway latency average spike. Everything seemed to be okay, and then I had a big spike. And this bubble here is showing me in my outlier. So my standard deviation increased after I had that spike as well. I'm here seeing some errors broken by node. So clearly there's some stuff going on and this seems to be on some very particular nodes. So we could click on this and, and dive a little bit further, or you can see from there on that highlighted black uh, white text on the black bubble that I'm having some issues with a travel checkout. It says customer service team dot travel dot checkout. So my checkout nodes are having issues. Perhaps my other notes are not, but my checkout notes seem to have, be having some issues. And so, uh, in short, what I'm showing you here is that I have some metrics, some data that is coming from metrics, combined with data that is coming from logs, and I'm able to put all this into one same dashboard and get this unified view of what's going on in my environment. This one on the top right-hand side is showing me my CPU and total memory. Let's expand it to see it a little bit bigger. So this one is showing me uh, Total CPU, if you look at that bubble there, is showing me metric equals average of CPU total. So this is my CPU total. So for my travel product, it seems to be just fine. See how it uh, continues going uh, at the same rate. But if you notice, around that same 950, I have a big spike here in, uh, in this one. And this one seems to be, again, my travel checkout node. So this is a second verification that there's something going on with travel checkout node. And if I look at this other one that spiked as well, it also seems to be for the travel checkout node. So at least I have a couple of, of, of nodes for travel checkout, and they both seem to be having some issues. So again, I have a good idea of what is going on. I don't know yet why this is happening, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through um, what, a, what someone would normally do troubleshooting this thing. I'm going to dive into this particular panel, and it's gonna take me to the metrics, um, to the metrics functionality so I can start looking a little more into what is going on in here. So let's look at the metrics panel and uh, or the metrics and, and see what's going on. So notice this metrics query, which is what the exact same one I was seeing before in the dashboard, has in reality two queries to it. One is looking for the CPU total. One is looking for memory usage. And memory usage seemed to be okay. It's this one up here. It did spike a little bit. But, you know, let me get rid of that one for now so it doesn't distract us. So I'm going to just click on this, and it's going to hide that. It's going to turn it off. You can toggle it on and off. Now I'm looking only at CPU total, and it's broken by node. So I'm doing an average by node. Everything seemed to be fine for these ones, but way up here I have some nodes that seem to be misbehaving. Again, I know, though, I, I now understand the, uh, the what is going on. I don't, know, I don't know the why just yet. I know that I can't do bookings, and I know that they are, it's probably related to my travel checkout notes. So check it out. This is what I'm going to do. I want to now dive into the logs that are relevant for this same time period and understand what is going on. I'm going to go to this bottom query here where I actually I can enter some information about the logs. 
So I'm going to look for source category. And for those of you who attended the Quick Start webinar, you remember that all data gets tagged with these different fields here, source, source category, source host. So I'm going to use source category. And since I know uh, from what I saw before that this has probably something to do with my, uh, with my travel checkout node, I'm going to choose that travel checkout node. And if I just run this for now, if I just say, okay, give me uh, information of all the logs that have, have anything to do with CS Travel Checkout Node, I can see here at the top, this is this orange bar that is up at the top, gets darker when you have more messages at a given point in time. So in here, it seems like I didn't have that much activity, and therefore my logs, even though I still have logs, they, they're, they don't, there doesn't seem to be that many. But soon, all of a sudden, in this particular area where my errors seem to have started, I seem to have a lot more logs. Let's make this a little more interesting. What if I now just search for the logs that have the word error in it? Or I could search for the word error, the word fail, um, whatever uh, you know you happen to look in your log files. And look at that. Now I'm filtering only those logs that have the word error. So I did not have anything happening uh, from an error perspective before 950 and then sometime around 950 boom I'm start getting a lot of errors those errors seem to be telling off but clearly a lot of activity at some point in time here so this is good I can see that my log files correlate to my metrics let me click on any of these here and if I do that the cool thing about this is I start seeing the logs of that same time period so I clicked on this little uh, cube here I could click that I could have clicked on any of these and it's serving me up all the logs that are relevant for that particular time period with the word error highlighted because that's what I was searching for before. Um, so this is great. I can start seeing the logs. Still a little bit hard to do because um, there's quite a lot of messages in here and it would take me a long time to read through all of these. So what I'm gonna show you is, um, although I can I can see here that there's some stuff happening with, uh, with for example here an error occurred in valid access key i can see that there's some issue here about a band handshake uh, apparently a certificate verified failed so i can start understanding a little bit of what's going on there seems to be some certificate issue and uh, and i'm having some errors in there let me show you a little better functionality or a little more functionality about this i can look at these errors and eyeball them or I can also, if you notice that little black box, it's, uh, it's giving me a tip. I can do a shift click to open these logs in the search. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to shift click. And what that's going to do is it's going to open these exact same logs, but I now I'm opening in, in this search tab, which allows me a lot more flexibility. I can choose a different time range. I can choose a larger time range. I can um, start parsing these fields, which you will learn a lot more about that um, as, I, as, I, as we go through this training today. Um, but let me do this. Um, very often, the word error just shows me the logs, or, or usually what happens is the word error shows me, um, shows me only those logs that have the word error, but very often, the error doesn't, the, what caused the error itself doesn't have the word error. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look for all, oops, sorry, I'm just going to look for all the log files. And since I know that this kind of started around 9.50, and then it's 9, uh, 9, 10, 23. Let's, let me choose, like, let's say um, the last, I'm going to say minus 40 minutes or minus 45 minutes. This is going to give me 45 minutes worth of logs um, that are all coming from that travel checkout. And I'm going to just look at them all in here. So if you look at this, um, it's about 51,000 messages, 52,000 messages. That's a lot of messages for me to rake through. So I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to short circuit this by clicking on this button called log reduce. Let me, while that is running, let me explain what log reduce does. As the word kind of suggests, it reduces the number of logs that I have into what we call signatures. So in this case, it's saying, hey, listen, Mario, there's about 2,600 messages that all look very similar. Yes, the date is going to be different because they're the log lines are different, and perhaps the IP address might be different. So all the things that you see here that are stars are the things that it's choosing to be variables. And it's saying, it looks like you have 6,000 messages that all have the same format. You have another 
2,000 messages that all seem to have this kind of same format. So it distilled those 53,000 messages into just three pages worth of logs that are now a lot easier for me to walk through, right? So I can now say, okay, I don't have to, I don't have to read through 2,000 messages because they all look very similar. So for uh, uh, to speed this little demo up, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into the uh, into the into the answer itself. But if you notice up here at the top, it's saying, okay, you've got about 2,200 messages that all had that certificate error. So remember I had seen a certificate error before? Well, it's telling me, by the way, there's 2,000 or 2,200 messages that all seem to have that same er error. And it said, get server certificate, certificate verify failed. Um, and then down here, uh, this, this one is actually a bit telling. Look at this one. This one is telling me that the Travelogic apps uh, was starting this cluster, the service checkout, but look at this. It says that it is starting it with version 1.14.dev. So knowing my business, what this tells me is that someone deployed development code into my production environment. Very possible they, de they deployed a development uh, certificate. And that is why now my, um, that is why I'm getting a certificate issue in my, uh, in my check checkout travel node. And that is causing people to not be able to book travel and it's causing all this havoc in here. It's causing people to not be able to book travel and it's causing all these other errors in here as well. So you see how we went from getting a big picture, getting a notification through Slack um, saying there is something wrong going on, diving into a dashboard, clicking in to see even a little bit more detail about what's going on in a particular area, diving into the relevant metrics, if you will, to find out what's going on, looking at the logs that are relevant for that particular time frame, and then diving into the logs themselves so that I can see what is going on and identifying the issue itself. Now, if I am this, uh, if I'm part of this IT ops team, what I would want to do now is say, well, listen, I don't want this to ever happen again. How do I keep an eye on this, uh, on this version that is being deployed? And what I would do is I would probably go back to my overview dashboard and add a little panel showing me the deployed versions, which is what I did here at the bottom right hand side. And so that now whenever something gets deployed, I can easily see for which cluster, what particular node and what version is deployed. And there you go. I can see that dev version has been deployed a few times. So that's uh, that's a way for me to keep an eye on that and to actually mitigate that particular issue. So this has shown you like super, super quick, but uh, a way to get, uh, to make use of Sumo Logic to create these dashboards, to create the uh, relevant alerts. I'm gonna close my Slack so that we uh, minimize distractions. Um, I can use alerts, I can use dashboards, I can use all these different tools to really help me um, get the benefit out of, uh, out of Sumo Logic. If I go back to, um, let me just close this guy here for a second. If I go back to the slides themselves, um, it's what, what I showed you is this bottom area here, how to build dashboards, how to schedule alerts, because this is really where the meat of it. Once you get to building your dashboards and building alerts, you're letting Sumo Logic tell you what is going on. Um, unfortunately, I have to show you the basic stuff, how to search, how to parse, how to analyze, so that then you can build those dashboards themselves. So today we're gonna spend the time up here, but just keep in mind, the end goal at the end of the day is, how do I create dashboards? How do I create alerts? So that Sumo works for me, rather than me filtering and searching within Sumo itself. Okay, with that in mind, um, I'm gonna skip through some of these things uh, about the demo itself. And let's talk about today. We're gonna to start with searching and parsing. So I'm gonna assume that you haven't used Sumo that much from what I heard uh, on the server itself. It looks like most of you haven't. So I'm gonna assume you haven't uh, really searched or filtered. I'm gonna start with that. I'm gonna show you, talk a little bit about metadata, talk a little bit about, about keywords and Lifetail. And then we're gonna pivot and start talking about parsing, which is the real true benefit of providing structure to your data. Um, with that said, I'm going to go into this instance. This, I'm just running on a training instance here. Um, I'm logged in as myself, who is an administrator. So I might have a little bit more capabilities that most of you have. Uh, if you're logged in as a as a um, as an as an analyst, you probably don't have the ability to 
set up collectors. You probably don't have ability to set up connectors um, or even to create a few of these other options that we're going to talk about later here. Um, having said that, you do have the ability to start searching, which is where we're going to start today. So you're brand new to Sumo Logic, and you're fi you find yourself here, and you wonder, how can I search? Well, you could do very simple searches like, oh, show me everything that has the word error. And it's going to go out there, and it's going to show you the word error um, out of uh, out of this uh, um, out of all your logs. Or perhaps you're looking for something very specific. Perhaps you're looking for a particular IP address, and you want to see all information that you've gotten from that IP address. You can just enter that IP address. You can enter an event code. You can enter a session ID. You can enter some whatever keyword you want to search for. You can enter it here. And it's going to go and filter that data out for you and bring back results. In this case, it's bringing me back anything that it found that has that keyword. Um, these are all great searches, but in, in reality, they're incredibly basic. You're just putting out there a, a word. Let's say I could have searched for the word Mozilla, and it's going to bring back anything that has the word Mozilla. In this case, it's bringing up um, Apache Access um, Apache Access logs that have in their user agent the word Mozilla. The more interesting or the better way to search is to make use of the metadata. Um, if you guys were in the Quick Start webinar, you, you would remember that every single message gets tagged with five very specific uh, metadata tags. One is collector, which collector this data came from. So if you know the name of your collectors and you want to search data just from that collector, definitely make use of the collector metadata tag so that you can narrow down the data that you're searching. Um, source, where that data is coming from. Source host, obviously the host where it's coming from. Source name, that is the file name, including the path of where that log came from. But the one that we, we usually tell you to use the most is source category, because this is something that you can set up to something that is meaningful to you. So if I choose source category, if you notice, I have my Apache Access Error, my Artifactory. I could have, for example, um, my, my Snort data in here as well. So you can start searching for very specific data. Let's, for the sake of arguments, choose Apache Access data. So now I'm narrowing my search to only look for that Apache Access data. And if I wanted to search for a particular keyword, let's say I wanted to see anyone that is searching, that is that is hitting my web servers from an iPhone, then I could say source category Apache Access and iPhone, and it's bringing me only data from Apache Access that has the word iPhone in it. All right, so I'm showing you easily how to use what we call metadata tags and keywords. Um, let's get to something a little more interesting. Well, while, while I'm here, let me explain a couple explain a couple of things. So you uh, notice that queries default to the last 15 minutes. You can choose 60 minutes, three hours, any of these drop downs. But what if you have data that is, uh, what if you want to search for a time frame that is not in here? Let's say last 45 minutes. So you notice the syntax minus 15m. If you want it minus 45, you can just do that, minus 45m. Or if you just wanted 15 minutes worth of data, but with an offset of 30 minutes, you could do that, minus 45 to minus 30. And that's going to give you 15 minutes worth of data, but starting 30 minutes ago. And you see that little blue bubble there is showing me exactly uh, what time frame it will pick according to my settings there. Um, if you are uh, writing an expression, it will give you this orange bar here telling you what it's expecting to see. So you get the point. Uh, minus 5M, minus 5D is days, minus 5H is hours. Pretty straightforward, right? What if you wanted to do a custom time range? For example, choose from March 5th through March 10th. But I actually want you to start from uh, on March 10th. I want you to go all the way to 8 a.m. Oops, there you go. And on this, on March 5th, I want you to start at 8 a.m. as well. So you could do that kind of stuff. You can say from a very specific time frame to a very specific time frame, click apply, it sets it for you, and then you can run that search pretty easily. All right, so for the sake of arguments, I'm going to keep it simple for now. I'm going to still do the last 15 minutes, source category is Apache Access, and the word iPhone, um, and is implicit. I could have done this, and it means exactly the same. Source category is Apache Access and iPhone, right? Or is explicit. I would have to uh, put the or there to uh, to mean that kind of stuff in there. 
All right, so what do I have here at the bottom? This little histogram here is showing me the, um, the number of messages that I got for a particular time period. So it's showing me that I, I got, um, it, broke my, it broke the histogram into a bucket of 15 because I asked for 15 minutes, and it's showing me the number of messages I got for each one of those. If there had been a spike, let's say this was a big spike in here, I could always use my little mouse and say, okay, I wanna look for this particular time range. And you notice as I highlighted that area, it reset the bottom area here to look only for those particular messages. It's telling me I'm actually now viewing just messages from 1021 to 1024, which is the time frame that I chose. I can X that out so that it gives me all the messages back again. And down at the bottom, as you can expect, I have the messages, the results themselves. So I'm looking at a, a 28 pages with, because it's 685 results that have Apache Access and the word iPhone for the last 15 minutes. Okay, so far so good. That's pretty straightforward. I've shown you how to search the data using filters um, or filtering by uh, keywords and filtering by this um, by metadata tags. But really, the value of Sumo Logic comes in when you start parsing. Let's take a look at this message here. Look, I have an IP address. I have a timestamp. I have a method. I have a URL. I have a status code. Wouldn't it be great if I could do a count by status codes? How many of these messages are 200s? How many of these messages are 404s? How many of messages are uh, 500s? So if I start parsing this data, I can start giving structure to the data so that I can do something with it. Let me show you quite a few different ways of parsing. This is, this is gonna be very, very important because parsing your data, it's really gonna allow you to get to the next level. So I'm gonna show you the simple way first and then I'm gonna show you quite a few other options. I'm gonna grab everything from this get all the way here to the end. And when I highlight that data, it actually pops up this and says, do you want me to add this to the, to the query up there and say, and all this, or and not, or or? Or do you want to parse the selected text? I'm going to parse it. I'm going to show you the easy way of parsing this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, listen, everything that is between the word get and the word HTTP, I'm going to extract that. And I'm going to, my mouse is uh, acting up. Oops, sorry. I'm going to, uh, let me just start again because my mouse was acting up. Let me grab everything from here to here and parse the selected text. There we go. All right, so anything between the word get and HTTP, I'm going to extract it, and I'm going to call that the, um, uh, that was the URL, I believe. I'm going to grab whatever is after that between spaces, and that's going to be my status code. And I think uh, you're getting the point. I'm going to grab this. This seems to be the size. And I'm going to grab um, all this here, all the way up to here. And I'm going to say, this is my uh, refer. And for sakes, uh, for speediness argument uh, sakes, I'm going to go here and say, all this other stuff, I'm just going to call it the user agent. Uh, why is my mouse acting up? Um, there we go. That's going to be my user agent. And look at this, if I click Submit, what happened is it just built the query for me. It just built that parse statement. And it says, okay, go find this pattern. And when you find that pattern, look for the word get and whatever's in between, pull that out as the URL and pull this out as the status code and the size and the fur and so on. And if I run this query now, as you guys would expect, it's going to parse out those fields, and it's great. Here's my message still over to the right-hand side. But now I've got my user agent, I've got the URL, I've got the status code, I've got the size, I've got the refer. And this is awesome because now with this parsed, I can really start doing things like count by status code. So now I can see how I can count the number of messages or uh, I can count the number of messages that I have broken down by status code. So you see how creating this parsing here is really going to allow me to start doing this kind of information. Perhaps I wanted to count by URL. So I can see which URLs get the most hit. And you can start seeing there that I have a count broken down by URL, which I can obviously um, um, rearrange. And I can see that my blog 
seems to be the one getting the most count. And then it looks to be like my style and my themes and whatnot. Um, but a lot more about counting and averaging and sorting and all that in a second. Let's go back to the parsing that I was talking about before. So what you've seen me do so far is I took a message and I parsed it out and I came back with some fields for that message. So I'm starting to give structure to that data by parsing it, right? Well, there's a lot of different ways of parsing and I'm gonna be doing this a lot. I'm gonna be sending you to that documentation uh, page. In particular, I wanna send you to the parsing operators, which we're talking about right now. So let me just go to the parse operators. Well, what we did is we had a predictable pattern. We knew that we were gonna see that word get and we knew, if you go back in here, we knew we were gonna see the word get and we know that we're gonna see the word HTTP. So this is very predictable. Find this pattern and extract those values. So what I did there is I used what we call uh, an R anchor parsing. I used the UI to, if you guys remember, parse selected text, I parsed it using this, I extracted fields. So this walks you through how I went about creating this parse statement using the UI and getting those results. Well, the question I often get is, and by the way, feel free to use the questions tab, the question panel on your uh, on your GoToMeeting if you have any questions as we go. I'm, I'm gonna try to answer them as we go as well. Um, so what the, the questions I get is, what if my parent patterns are variable? What if I don't have predictable patterns? Well, most of us have at one point or other used regex. Some of us are experts at regex and otherwise other, others are uh, learning it. But regex allows me to, uh, to specify regex to do any parsing. As a matter of fact, let me do this. Um, for those of you who don't know regex, let me explain it super, super quick here with this example. This is saying, find a digit or find a number that is between one and three characters, then you'll find a period, then another number between one and three characters, a period, and then this repeats again two more times. So if you guys think of this, this looks like an IP address, right? It's essentially saying, find this pattern, and if you find it, store it in a variable called IP address. That's literally what that is saying. So let me do that. Let me just grab this thing here exactly as it is. I'm going to copy it, go back to my query. I'm going to paste it right underneath the existing parse statement. So now you notice I can actually have multiple parse statements if I want to. And I'm going to click on start. And what this command is doing is saying, all right, find this pattern and parse this out. And for all those things that you just parsed, send them to this next parse statement and parse the IP address as well. So now notice, I've got the IP address, I've got the refer, I've got the size, I've got the status code, the URL, the user agent, and so on. So as you can imagine, I can now do something like um, average of size um, group by IP address. Is that what I called it? Yeah. So look at this. Oh, uh, group. If I could spell group, that would be a little bit better. All right. Let's look at this now. Check it out. With a very simple query, now I can see, and let me just um, make this uh, this way. Now I can see which IP addresses are give, sending me the biggest loads, um, the, the biggest average number of bytes. So 6,000 is coming from this particular IP address, whereas I have other IP addresses where the average is just about 3,500 3, bytes. So um, a lot more about uh, about grouping and all that good stuff, but for now, you start seeing the benefits of parsing in here. So let's go back to that document just so that I can show you a few more options. So I talked a little bit about parsing um, parsing with regex. The cool thing is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that we already know formats. If you're sending us data in JSON format, guess what? We know what JSON looks like. So we have. A, uh, an operator called JSON. As a matter of fact, we have an operator that that you can do JSON auto, and it's gonna go in here and say, okay, all this looks like JSON, I'm gonna parse it out for you. Um, uh, if you're sending us, let's see, yeah, 
I just want to – essentially, the JSON auto option says, oh, I understand that this is JSON. I'm going to parse out the first 100 fields. We limit it to that because we don't know if you really, really wanted to parse everything. But um, this JSON auto just parses the first 100 fields, and it gets that data out for you, and you can start using it right away. If you're sending us, um, if you're sending us key value pairs, so that means – name equals Mario, company equals Sumologic, we know what key value looks like and we can parse that automatically for you. You just say KV auto or key value auto and we can parse that. If you're sending a CSV format, we know what that looks like so we can parse it out. If you're sending us other delimited logs that are using things like a tab or a colon, you can use the split operator to do that. If you're sending us XML, we can obviously take care of that as well. There's a couple of options that I want to talk about today as well. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about the field option first. So field essentially says, if you already have a parsed field, let me give you an example. If you look at my parsing statement here, you'll notice that, uh, let's say, um, hmm, let's say the refer. Actually, the refer is, um, let's actually, here's a good one. Let's say the user agent. Let's say I want to parse out of here um, which which operating system it's using. Is it, is it using Opera or which browser it's using? I'm sorry. Is it using Opera? Is it using Mozilla? Is it using um, Firefox? Is it using whatever the operator is? I could do additional parsing of this field to get more information out of it. And that's exactly what this field option does. It says you would basically say parse field equals user agent and then you would specify the parsing expression, whether that's a regex or not. In this particular case, I'm parsing the user um, so that I can extract the value. See here, I have a field that has all this. I can say user equals star, and I can parse out the J Smith out of it, right? Um, so it just allows you to do additional parsing to fields that already exist. The other option that I wanted to talk about was this one called Node Drop. And this is a great option. What Node Drop allows you to do, actually, let me go back to this example and show you. All right. In this particular query, if I search for Apache Access and iPhone, it searches for all the different, uh, all the different uh, messages for that. It sends those messages to this parse statement. And this first parse statement parses out anything that has this pattern. But if it finds messages that do not have that pattern, those messages simply get dropped and, um, and they don't get accounted for. So the next message here, the next uh, parsing statement, only acts on the messages that were passed on by this one in here. However, what if I wanted, to, what if I wanted this field here not to drop the messages that it doesn't have um, that, that it didn't recognize. Then what you can do is you can add the option of a no drop. And that says, even if you did not find this pattern, don't drop those messages. Just send them over to the next parse statement because I might want to parse them with that. Let me show you a cool example in here. What if I search for, the, for anything that has Apache access? That means I'm parsing Apache access, uh, Apache star. That means I'm, I'm, I'm parsing Apache access, but I'm, also, um, but I'm also parsing Apache error. So the Apache error logs, uh, let's see if I find anything here, uh, might be, oh, no, that's not a good one. Um, the Apache error logs would, um, hmm, I thought I was gonna find some simple examples easily, but this might be a little harder to do. Um, my point was the Apache error logs would not have this kind of pattern but they would certainly have an IP address. So I still want to parse out the IP address from the Apache error logs, even if they don't have a URL, a size, a refer, a status code, and that kind of stuff in there. So I would, um, I would be able to, to see them off of here as well. Okay, so with all that in mind, um, I cannot stress enough how important it is to parse your data, whether you parse it using any of our standard operators or uh, you parse it using uh, parse regex so that you can go crazy with uh, your regex expressions and parse all this stuff. Parsing is definitely one of the key things. If, I, if there's anything that you want to take from this, from, from today's session is parse your data, parse your data, parse your data, because it's going to allow you to structure that data and start doing aggregation and whatnot. All right. 
So I showed you some of the operators that you can do parsing in here. But one of the questions I get all the time is, well, that's cool, Mario. You were showing me how to parse, but you know what? I look at this Apache access data all the time. Does that mean that I have to parse every single time and come and search? And the answer is no. You can actually create what is called a field extraction rule, or I should rephrase that. Your administrator can create something called a field extraction rule. And what a field extraction rule does is, I mean, the name kind of implies it. It extracts fields from the data at the time that the data is being ingested. So that's the key thing. What it's going to do, here's one already for Apache Access. Check it out. Let's, uh, let's just go edit it so you can see it. Essentially, this says, okay, if I ever get any data ingested that has a source category equals Apache Access, I want you to apply this parsing expression to it. Uh, and this looks familiar, right? That first line says, parse out the IP address. And the other lines in here are saying, okay, parse out the method, parse out the URL, parse out the status code, and so on. So essentially, I'm, I created a rule saying, whenever I get data that looks like this, parse it out using this expression. And how do you know if it's working? Well, I'll show you. I'm going to go back to that search. Let me run that search without my parsing statements. So here is the search just saying source category equals Apache Access for the last 15 minutes. Let's run that search and see what happens. Uh, oops, uh, source category equals Apache, Apache, no, Apache Access, sorry. Uh, oops, uh, let's run that. And um, here we go. Here are my messages, right? The same, same exact same messages, 28,000 messages for Apache Access in the last 15 minutes. Over here on the left-hand side, I have what is called the field browser. And right now, as display fields, it's just showing me time and message. You notice? Time and message. But there's a whole bunch of other fields that are available to me. The ones to notice right away are the metadata tags, source category, source host, source name. Remember, those are just metadata that comes with the tool. But over here, I'm also getting the fields that my field extraction rule parsed. The method, the refer, the size, source IP, status code. So I can see that these fields have already been parsed through that, uh, through that field extraction rule. Not only have they been parsed, it's actually collecting a whole bunch of information for me already. It's telling me that about 70% of my messages happen to have a status code of 200, uh, only about 15% of 304, and so on. So you see how it's parsing out all this information for me thanks to that field extraction rule that is that was in place. And if you're, a, if you're an administrator and you want to create a field extraction rule, I'll show you how simple it is. You can go in here, say add, specify what your source category is going to be. So you can say, anytime I get a message where source category um, equals uh, Apache access, um, but you can make this as, as complex as you want. It could be maybe you just want it from the collector um, for the from the collector that starts with dev. Perhaps you have different collectors for dev. Oops, sorry, I keep uh, hitting the wrong key. Perhaps you have collectors for dev versus collectors for prod, and you call it something like dev star. You could do this. You could say just for my dev, just for the data coming from that collector dev, which has a source category of Apache access, I want the following parse expression to be executed. Or we try to make it simple for you. We actually have some templates. Let's say that you were bringing in Nginx logs. We say, well, here is a template for Nginx logs. We know what Nginx logs look like. Or let's say you were bringing in uh, Palo Alto Networks uh, data. Because we know what that data looks like, we actually give you a template saying, oh, parse all this big string as, and here's all the different field names that, uh, that we suggest that you use. And with that in mind, you can just click on add and it's going to create that parse. Uh, it's going to create that field extraction rule for you. And here's some examples of that. Okay. All right. I see no questions on that tab. So I'm going to assume everybody is uh, understanding and really gets the point that parsing is going to get you uh, a long way because either, either parsing in the field themselves in the query itself or parsing with a field extraction rule so that you can take advantage of those fields later on. Okay, so with that in mind, let me just go back in here. 
I've shown you how to do some searching, how to filter your data using metadata keywords, uh, metadata and keywords. I've shown you how to parse using uh, parsing using parsing within the query. I've also talked about field extraction rules. Um, let me talk now a little bit about LiveTail before I go on to the next topic, which is how to start analyzing your data. So LiveTail, as the name suggests, what LiveTail allows you to do is it allows you to do a tail on your log file. So you can go in here and say source category equals Apache access. Here's the really cool thing. If I'm a developer, I don't even have access to the production boxes, right? I don't even get to see all that data because, or perhaps I have to skip to, um, you know, a bridge to then go into my, um, to then go into the production environment. We've all done it. We've all had to have multiple jumps to get to the production so you can tail logs in one box and then you have to go do the same in the different, in the, in the next box, in the next box, in the next box. Here, what you're seeing is through this tool, I'm actually being able to live tail across all my Apache access log files, regardless of which box they happen to sit on. I can pause those logs, I can scroll up, I can review them. Um, probably even more interesting, maybe I want to see only those that have the word uh, Mozilla in it. Poor Mozilla, I keep, I keep uh, uh, using it as an example, but there you go. And I can say, oh, you know what, and highlight all the words that have on 404, or the word error, or the word um, Firefox. I don't know, I'm making some stuff up now. But now it's showing me only source category Apache access with the word Mozilla, and it's highlighting some terms in here that I can always scroll back and come back and start seeing. So this gives me, this is not meant to replace all the functionality that I just showed you, all that, um, all the searching and, and aggregating and all that stuff. This is meant to complement it. I can get a quick search of what's happening right now I can get a good idea, but if, as soon as I want to find trends, as soon as I want to find outliers, that's where my um, that's where all that power of the search happens to be. So you can see from here, I can quickly go back and take this same query and show it in the search, so I can start aggregating, I can start parsing, and all that. Right? So this is just meant to complement. One other thing I want to talk about uh, LiveTail, and this is pretty cool. Again, I'm going to take you to documentation. I'm going to show you that in addition to this UI uh, tool that is in here, we actually we have a command line interface tool for LiveTail as well. And this one works uh, as you'd expect. You install, the, uh, you install the client, which you can get at GitHub. You have to do a little bit of a handshake in terms of a, a, an access key and all that stuff. But once it's in place, you would run it from your um, from your environment, something like LiveTail equals, uh, I'm sorry, LiveTail source category equals, and then you'd specify your source category and some keywords if you want, and it will give you all the uh, details on that. Or probably more interesting, you could do something like LiveTail source category equals Apache access, and then you can pipe that into your grabs, you can send it to out.txt. So you can you can see the benefits of starting to use this tool where you can get access to all your data, whether it's in, even in production environments, and then combine it with your grabs and the tools that you're already familiar with. So highly recommend uh, installing your Lifetail CLI because it's gonna come in pretty handy when you're doing that troubleshooting. Uh, in your logs themselves. Okay, with that said, um, showed you how to search, showed you how to filter, how to use metadata, keywords, live tail. Parsing, I cannot stress enough how important parsing is gonna be for you, um, whether you do the query, the parsing in the query, or you work with your administrators to ensure that you build the right field extraction rules in your environment. All right, let's move on to data aggregation. So I showed you a little bit. I showed you how to do some counts. I showed you how to do some sums. Um, but where I really want to spend a little bit of time today is in this advanced analytics. But let's start simple. Let's start with the basics here. Let go, let's go back to, um, uh, to our tool. I'm promising very little uh, PowerPoint and more tool usage because a lot of you like to go back to this video and review it and be able to, um, to do some of these examples as well. By the way, I will be recording this and I'll be sharing it with everybody um, who registered for this session. Okay, so let's go back to, to this tool and let's say that I've got my source category equals Apache access. There you go. So 
um, I can search easily all my logs for the last 15 minutes for Apache access. Now, if you guys remember, I have a field extraction rule in place. So therefore, my fields are already parsed in here. I can very easily now do something like count by, uh, let's see what it's called. In this case, it's called source IP. So if I want to uh, count by IP, I just have to make sure that I know the right uh, name for that field. And as easy as that, I can do a count by source IP. Well. Let me talk a little bit about these different uh, these different things. And while I do that, again, I'm going to take you to documentation, and I'm going to show you something called a cheat sheet. We have a little cheat sheet here that's going to be very, very handy for you. Um, this one is all the different operators that we have. Now, there's way too many operators for me to be able to go through all of these today. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to highlight the ones that are key, the one that you, the ones that you're going to be using. Um, 80 or 90, maybe even 95% of the time. Um, obviously, the parsing ones I already showed you, right? These are the ones that we talked about earlier today. Here's from an aggregation perspective. This cheat sheet has all the different operators, but it's built in a way where it shows me the operator, a description, and a little example of how to use it, right? So here, what if I wanted to do the average time by um, by IP address? So all I have to do is copy this example. I'm going to take it back to my query and then I can do a instead of account by source IP, perhaps I want to do a average oops, average uh, size by source IP. So you see how I can easily figure out how to do it. And for those of us who have played with um, who have played with SQL before, this is where it's very SQL like there's where clauses and, and that kind of stuff that transfer to this language very easily as well. Right. All right. There you go. Average by source IP. If I wanted to do a um, uh, if I wanted to do a count, I think I was doing a count by uh, status code before that. That's a little bit more meaningful. So I can see um, which status codes happen to happen to be hit hitting the most. Uh, what if I don't like this word count? What if I want to call it hits? I can say count as hits by status code. So therefore, I would change the name itself in here. One of the things that you notice is if I don't rename a field, let's say I just do count by status code, the result of it is the same name as the uh, operator. It just puts an underscore in front of it. So in this case, it calls it underscore count, um, right? Uh, let's do counts as hits by status code. So there it is, my my status codes. Now, if I was the uh, IT ops person in here, and I see that I actually have, you know, 25, 2600 404s in the last 15 minutes, what I would want to know is, are these happening all the time across the board, or is there a spike where all of these happened? Um, these 404s. So I'm going to introduce a new operator. Well, there's two easy ways that I could do this. One of them is I could say and status code equals 404. Why can I use this? Because this is a field that already exists, and I can just uh, and I can just uh, look at that. And this is showing me that most of those spikes happen in this particular time frame, not over here. So I can I can easily see from this histogram that even though in aggregation I have 5,000 hits, this histogram is showing me that most of them happen in this particular time over here, right? Or let's introduce a new operator that is going to become very, very, very useful for you. I'm going to introduce a new operator called a time slice. And you probably saw that on the example I was grabbing before here, um, time slice. What is time slice? As the name suggests, time slice allows me to slice my time period. In this case, I'm doing 15 minutes, let's say 60 minutes. Let's say I'm going to choose 60 minutes. I can time slice those 60 minutes into five minutes, into buckets of five minutes. Or I can time slice it into buckets of one minute. In this case, I would have 60 buckets. Or I can time slice it into buckets of 10 minutes. In this case, I would have six buckets, right? Let's do, um, let's do five minutes. So I can have 12 buckets in here. And then I'm not only going to count my hits by status code, 
but I'm also I'm going to count them by time slice as well. So now I'm going to count this by time slice and by status code. And you notice that I used an underscore. And if you guys remember from what I just said before, the result of an operator, if you don't rename it, is just that same name with an underscore in front of it. So now look at this. I get my hits, but I'm getting them broken by time and by status code. So I can see that at 1040 for status code 403, I had 16 hits. And at uh, 330, at 10 a.m., I had, for, I'm sorry, at 10 a.m. for status code 302, I had these many hits, and you get the point. This is kind of still a little bit hard to read. So I'm going to show you a new operator that is going to make it so much easier. This one is called transpose. And what transpose allows me to do is change this list into a table. So I'm going to say my row is going to be my time slice, like that, and my column is going to be uh, my status code. And with this information, I'm going to turn that list that I had before into a nice table that is a lot easier to read. Now I can see that at 1010, remember these are uh, five minute buckets, right? So at 1005, I had these many hits by, by status code 1010, 1015, 1020, 1025, and you get the point. By uh, it broke it down by the time by the time slices that I wanted, and it's now showing me the different um, the different uh, hits that I got for each one of these um, for each one of these status codes. Good. So far, so good. So what I'm showing you right now is some kind of aggregation, some sort of like counting, uh, averaging, summing. All those are very simple operators that I can show you here. There's average, there's count. Um, there's a few that are a little more obscure, but uh, that help you um, try to find, for example, fill missing allows you to identify those slices where you have no hits. So if I go back to this example, if I didn't have any hits, for example, in this particular time slice, it would not even show me that row. But if I want to fill in all the rows that are missing, I would use an operator like fill missing. Um, there's first and last, mix man, uh, min and max, sorry, percentage, standard deviation. So you get the point, the standard stuff. You have some search operators. So again, I won't be able to go through all of these, but I'm going to try to show you enough examples to give you a good gist of the ones that are, that are the most meaningful for this. All right. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you for, about this, and then I'm going to go into more interesting operators, is great. Now that you got to here, and you probably right now you would be saying, well, I could do a lot of that stuff with gred, with greps. I could do that stuff with my aux and sets. Well, the easy, the cool thing is that it's super easy to go from here to say a visual. All I have to do right now, I'm I'm in table mode. What if I wanted to show a column chart? What if I wanted to show a line chart or perhaps an area chart or perhaps even a pie chart of this kind of stuff, right? I can pick and choose which charts I want to show. And I can even start playing here and say, I don't want to show the 200s because they're taking over all this stuff. And I don't even want to show the 304s because they're really overpowering my stuff. So now I'm showing my data without those ones. And it's clear from here that I have a big spike in my 404s at some particular point in time. Remember, we had seen that before. So what if I wanted to make those uh, the permanent, the fact that the 200s and 304s shouldn't be there? Um, this I could do in two different ways. Um, I could do it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to, yeah, I'm, I am going to show you two different ways and talk about the benefits of them. One way that I could do this is I could say, as most of us already know SQL, I can say where status code equals 200 or status code equals 304. But since I don't want that stuff, I'm just going to put a bang in here. So this is using it like a where clause. So go fetch me all the messages. And then once you have all those messages, let's say a thousand messages come back, don't include these ones in here. So those a thousand messages, not got trickled down to let's say 200 messages. All right, so now these 200 messages, I apply a time slice, a count, a transpose, and all that good stuff. So this is one way to do it. And you'll, you'll see if I run this query, it'll now give me my graph without the 304s and the 200s, just like I want it. 
a better way to do this is to actually add this here to your top line. And why is that? Uh, this, this is actually, these two things produce the exact same thing. I'm actually going to just comment this out just to show you. Um, so if you notice, the answer for these two things is exactly the same. Uh, putting it as an and at the top or putting it as a where clause here. However, the top, this option that we did at the second time is the preferred option. The reason for that is that the most filtering you can do in the first line, that means there are less records being passed on to the next and the next and the next and the next line. So this here brings back not a thousand records, but only the 200 records that you really cared about. So you minimize the amount of computing that you have to do and you improve the performance. So just keep that in mind. The more that you can squeeze into your top line in terms of filtering, the better, because that's going to make your queries run a lot faster. All right, so there you go. Here is my graph now. I see my 404s are spiking over here. Each one of these graphs has different options and settings that you can play with. Here, let me show you one. I'm going to choose a bar chart, and I'm going to go to Settings, and I'm going to click on Change Series, and I'm going to turn that 404 into a line chart. Um, and I'm going to use a secondary axis just to show you relatively the differences. So now I'm showing you the 404s. I'm sorry, the, uh, I'm showing you the 404s, which are here in the line, compared to all my other um, status codes, if, if it is the 404s that I want to highlight. Um, and it can be done as simple as that. Okay, so charting is going to be, be very, very useful as you start uh, wanting to dashboard a lot of this data. Good. Um, no questions. What I'm going to do is we have about 20 minutes. I want to jump into the more interesting operators that we have. So uh, right now you're, you've are you seen some simple aggregation. I, I showed you some counts. I showed sums, averages. I took you all the way to being able to chart something and be able to identify some sort of outliers like the case here with my 404s. Let me now walk you through a little bit of the out-of-the-box operators that help you do that same kind of analysis, right? Help me identify some outliers, help me predict what's going on in my queues, help me identify transactions as they move from one place to another. Um, perhaps I want to do some lookups to some files or some geo lookup to find identify customer locations. And these last two, I used one of these in my in my demo, log reduce, the ability to take a lot of data and reduce it so that it's easily easily searchable and, and, and start identifying outliers. So let me do that. Let me go back to our instance here. And let me start. I cheated because I actually built some of these queries. But just for uh, just to in, in order to be able to go through this a little quicker, you can always uh, review this video, pause it, go back to it, and, and identify how, how some of these were done. But let me show you the first one. The first one I want to show you is called the geolookup operator. So this is a pretty cool operator. It allows us to, as a matter of fact, before I dive into it too much, um, why don't I just look for that operator lookup? So I'm going to look for the lookup operator, and you'll notice that there are two different lookup operators. There's a lookup operator that allows me to just search uh, against um, against a file. If you if you have some file that is sitting out in some server out there, you can do a lookup operator on that file and bring back some fields of that file. Or you can have you can use this lookup operator on data that exists within Sumo as well. And the second type of lookup that I have in here is the geo lookup operator. And the geo lookup allows me to look at my IP addresses and map them like this so that I can start identifying what's going on in my environment. Here's an example of a query and you notice it, it parses the IP address. And once I have that IP address, I'm going to use it using this kind of, um, this kind of syntax in here. So matter of fact, this query is asking for a lot more. So I'm just going to copy this and steal it. Let's go back to our piece here. So if you notice, I'm parsing the IP address. Remember, you know what? I actually already have my field extraction rule, so I don't even need this field. So I'm going to get rid of that because my field extraction rule already parsed that IP address for me. So this is saying, look up latitude, look up longitude. As a matter of fact, look up all these other fields, country code, name, region, city, postal area, metric code, from this service that we offer here at Sumo on 
IP address equals source IP. Source IP is a field that already exists for me, so I can use it. And then I'm going to count by all these different fields in here. So let's run that. And what you'll see is it's going to come back with, um, it finds the IP address for all my messages. And then it comes back and says, here's the lat latitude, longitude, and all that good stuff. So since I have latitude and longitude, I can use this option in here. Let me just expand this so you can see. And it's just mapping for me that easily all the IP addresses that I have. And I, as you can imagine, I can zoom in and it's going to start breaking out where the hits are coming from uh, in this particular case. Right? Pretty cool. All right, let me go back to the table itself. And what if I only wanted the stuff coming from uh, the US? Let's keep it simple. If I want to see only country code equals US, what do you guys think I could do? Well, as you would expect, I think all of you know the answer already. All I had to do is add a WHERE clause, WHERE country code equals, and I can just specify US in here. Now, notice you have to put that WHERE clause after the lookup, otherwise it doesn't know what the field country code is. Um, and you probably want to do it before the count so it doesn't count all other fields it, themselves. It just counts the the ones that you care for. So there you go. Now it's just focused on country code equals US. If I look at the map now, it probably will only show me a map of the US because that's the area that I decided to focus on. All right, let's talk about the next one, outlier. I cannot ex stress how important this operator is gonna become for you. Operator allows, uh, outlier allows me to identify outliers in my data. So here's an example. Source categories equals Apache access. My status code equals 404. So show me only the messages that have a status code equals 404. I can do this because status code already exists. Thank you to my field extraction rule, right? Then I time slice my data by one minute, and then I'm just doing a count. This, this is just another syntax of saying count all my messages. And, because since I'm only looking for the 404s, count all my messages as server error counts and do it by time slice. Let me actually show you the results of that stuff. This looks very similar to what we were doing earlier. Just a count by time slice. Here's my server error count by time slice. I just renamed this to server error count. But now here's the cool thing. I'm gonna use this operator called outlier. All these guys, I'm, I'm saying run an outlier on server error count. So go and look at server error count over time. So since I have time slice, look at a trend over time and look at the five previous data points. That's what this window five equals is saying. Look at the five previous data points to identify what the standard deviation should be. In this case, I care for two standard deviations. That, that's what the threshold is saying. The cool thing about outlier is that it builds all these fields for me. It builds, here's my server error count, but it creates an upper level, a lower level, a count, a, uh, a mean, a standard deviation, a violation. Let me show you graphically what that looks like. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's what that looks like. It's saying, listen, for the most part, your count of 404s was somewhat stable with a few minor spikes, but then at some point in time you had a huge spike, and that's why your standard deviation after that seems to be pretty big. Let's change this threshold to, let's say, four standard deviations. So now you'll notice that a lot of these pink triangles are gone because for standard deviations, it's a lot bigger, harder to break. As a matter of fact, let's do like seven. And maybe in this case, I will only have one triangle here, right? So you were within your standard deviations all this time. And then at some point, boom, you spiked above a, a standard deviation. And this pink triangle is marked here as a violation um, well, it's page 103, so let me just go back to the bottom. Um, somewhere in here, <laughs> under violation, I would have it with a 1 because it's identifying that I have a... There you go. Here it is. So here's the case where my server error count violation is equal to 1. That's the case where I have a pink, pink triangle showing me that I have a, uh, a standard deviation. I have a point outside of my standard deviation. Okay. Just... So um, Outlier, incredibly, incredibly helpful. It gives you the ability to identify what something, uh, when something is outside of the norm. And tomorrow when we talk about um, alerts, I'm going to talk about Outlier a lot. I'm going to show you how we use Outlier 
As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you right now. Very, very simple. If I wanted to create an alert, all I have to do is identify when this is set to one, right? I'm going to at least give you the beginnings of the uh, of the uh, of that. So if I go in here now and I do where this guy is greater than zero, now it's only going to show me the messages where I have a standard devi uh, deviation. I have a violation, I'm sorry. So now I can easily create a scheduled alert off of this. Tomorrow we'll talk about the mechanics of how to do it and so on, but you now start seeing how I can use these operators to make the system work for me. Create dashboards, create alerts, create things that are telling me what to do. All right, since I only have 10 minutes, I'm gonna rush through this. Let's talk about predict. Predict allows me to do what the, system, what the name says, um, kind of figure out a way to predict what is happening in my data or what will happen in my data, however many data points I decide to forecast. This one here is just saying, look, it looks like your data points were all up here. My guess is projection wise, it's gonna start looking the same. This is the simple predict. As a matter of fact, let me go open this up in the help. I promised I was gonna be sending you to documentation a lot, a lot and I'm, uh, I'm doing it. Um, this predict that I just showed you is our simple predict, which essentially says, okay, looks like your data is trending down, so I can give you a forecast of when it's going to hit zero. Let's say these were these were items in a queue, and you want to find out when you're going to finish all those items in the queue. This can predict it this way. But we also have something called um, the AR model or the auto regressive model. And what the auto regressive model does is, let me see if I have a a better well here's a good one what an auto regressive model does is it looks at patterns in the past so it could be in the last week maybe these are spikes on mondays maybe these are spikes in the in the middle of the day so i'm looking at a given day and it can give you uh, it can bake those spikes or those cyclical um movements of data into your uh, into your model as well. So there's the autoregressive model, a little bit more advanced, or the very simple model of just forecasting with a straight line of what's happening down the line. So predict certainly um, a, a good tool for you to use. This is one that uh, that I want to uh, I want to show you briefly. Um, this one's called the transaction operator. So a lot of you ask, well, you know, how do I keep track of what's going on from state to state? Perhaps what you want to find out is you have a session ID or you have a, some sort of unique ID and you want to identify how things move from one environment to the other. Um, I've cooked up here a very simple example. I have my source category prod uh, app e-commerce. This is, let's say that I have a website where people can buy stuff, like that, something similar to like an Amazon.com where people can go and buy things. So what I'm doing is I first identify their IP address, and that's what I'm going to use as a unique ID. If I had a session ID or if I had a unique user ID or an email address, that would be a lot better to do. But in my case, I don't have that, so I'm going to use the IP address as the unique ID in here. And I'm going to say, okay, I want to use this tra transaction operator, and I'm going to be using this IP address, which I just parsed, as the unique identifier. And now any message that I get that has the word confirmation in it, I want to create a new state called the confirmation state, and the order ship state, and the cart state, and the shipping state, and the billing state. And then I'm going to plot those results and by counting the from state to stew state. And what I end up with is some a result that looks something like this. It's showing me that I had a lot of people come in and put stuff into the cart. Then I had a lot of people move over, about 100%, I would say, moved from cart over to shipping info, and they looked at the shipping info. But just a very, very small fraction out of these 708 that came into the shipping info, only eight moved on to confirmation page. So only eight actually paid and moved on to um, to do that. And then I can see what moved on to order shipping. So this is shedding light into the fact that 700 people decided not to pay, not to buy whatever they had in their cart. Is this due to a bad design in my web page? Is it due to bad uh, may, perhaps I have a certificate issue and people cannot pay or whatever the problem is. They, my point is that these, this uh, transaction operator is showing you how things can go from one state to the other and start shedding some light on that kind of stuff.
right? So you start seeing how we have some operators that, that make it a lot easier for you to do. All right, the last two I want to show you um, are a little easier to show. Uh, let me just close some of these here. Um, let's pull data out. Let's, uh, let's see. I'm going to grab source category equals um, prod security snort. So here is my snort data which is security data that gives me information on intrusions, it gives me information on uh, leaks, it gives me information of any Trojan network or any, any attacks that I'm getting to my site. Um, all right, I'm running this for the last 15 days. Let's run it for a little bigger. Let's say that I run this for the last 60 minutes. So for the last hour, I can see that there's about 6,000 results. And if I am the security engineer or the IT ops person or whomever is looking at this data, now I have to start raking through all this and I can see some attempted information leak. I can see a web application attack. I can see quite a lot of stuff going on in my environment. But as you guys are well aware, not always do we know exactly what we're searching. If I'm, if I'm searching for a web attack, that's great. I can say web attack and I'm going to get all logs that have the words web attack as part of it. Actually, none of them. <laughs> um, but if I am looking, oh, well, let's say uh, leak. If I look for uh, the word leak, I can get everything in the last hour that has the word leak. But if I don't know necessarily what I'm looking for, what I can do is I can say, okay, give me this data for the last 60 minutes and then hit that log reduce button. You guys remember that? What log reduce is doing is saying, okay, I'm going to look at all those 6,000 messages and I'm going to start categorizing them into signatures. So great, here the attempted information leak happened 1,800 times. Of course, the IP address might be different, the port might be different, but the main bit here happens to be the same. So I can start looking at all these and say, oh yeah, 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 these are the attacks that we're getting on a regular basis. We're actually covered for those. Let's see what are the attacks that are happening. What are the new things that are happening? So I can even sort by count and see, oh man, look at this. Here's some stuff that I hadn't seen before. A suspicious file file name was detected. So I can actually, or, or look at this one, attempted information leak from a particular bug port. I can actually go into that particular message by clicking on this little link, go to the message itself, and I see which host it's happening for, which source category is happening for, and perhaps what I want to do now is say, oh, only for this host, not for the entire Prod Security Snort, but just for that host, I actually want to see the surrounding messages. Show me the messages that were happening five minutes before, five minutes after. I want to see who logged on, who did what, and what happened. And there you go. Now you're seeing the message itself, but I'm also seeing exactly what happened before that time frame. And I can now keep maybe comb with a finer, uh, uh, with a finer comb here and start looking at this data um, if I want to as well. All right, so that's what log compare log reduce is all about. Now, there's the last one I want to show you, and this one's called log compare. Log compare goes hand in hand with log reduce. What log reduce does, if you guys remember, is it gives me my 60 minutes worth of data and it reduces them down to signatures. What I can do is say, well, I want to compare these signatures to a signatures 24 hours ago to see if things look similar or different or what. So you can do a log compare against 24 hours ago, seven days ago, or you can use your custom time frame. I'm just going to choose 24 hours ago. And what it's doing right now is it's doing a log compare with a time shift of minus 24. And it's going to come back and say, all right, Mario, here's the deal. This signature showed was there 24 hours ago and it's there now. However, now it shows up a little more. It shows 1.3% more of the time. However, this signature here happens to show up less. This one is showing 1.5% less of the time. And you get the point. It's kind of giving me the delta of how much the signatures have changed. Or it could even be, it could even say, listen, this signature here happens to be new altogether. I wasn't seeing it 24 hours ago, and now I see it. This is a whole new signature. And here's other ones, for example, this one, that is gone altogether. This signature was there 24 hours ago, and now I don't see it at all. So you start seeing how this, um, 
how this log compare is giving you the deltas of what's going on, what happened before and what happened after. And I'm going to leave you with, with one last thought. We have one minute here, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. What if you wanted to compare your dev environment to your prod environment? You could do that as well. I'm about to push code. Let me see how this looks in my dev environment versus how it looks in my production environment before I push that code. All right. So I've shown you quite a bit of information today. In particular, I've shown you. Um, let me let me backtrack to this to this particular um, slide here. In particular, I've shown you how to search and filter, how to parse your data, and we started looking at how to analyze that data. These three things that I showed you are the building blocks. Um, they're not the answer. They're just a means to an end. The, at the end of the day, where you want to be is you want to build dashboards. You want to start visualizing your data. You want to have the ability to be able to pull up something like this and find out if everything is running smoothly or if you actually need to uh, take some action. I'm going to just refresh that dashboard and hopefully things are, are back to normal. Um, you want to set up yourself some scheduled alerts some scheduled searches so that on a regular basis, you're not having to do the work to go in and find stuff, but instead you're getting notified of all those critical events. So if you, get, if you guys remember, I closed it, but I had, some, uh, I had some alerts popping up in my travel ops channel that is telling me what is going on. Um, and uh, last but not least, we'll talk about, or perhaps tomorrow I'm gonna kick off with apps themselves. What are the different apps that are in the system that I can start taking advantage of right away um, to make this a lot easier for me. Okay, with that said, I'm going to break for today, um, but let me open it up to any questions that you guys might have.